Kristen Atchison here, and we're talking about learning. Specifically, we're going to talk about operant conditioning today. So remember, learning is a relatively permanent change in behavior that we have based on a repeated experience. And now these are things that we can't explain away by some sort of innate process or a reflex or some sort of instinct. This isn't something that we just grow into. Um, this is about, about new, a repeated experience changing um, our behaviors. So we've previously talked about classical conditioning. Now we're going to talk about operant conditioning. Um, operant conditioning, one of our big names in operant conditioning is B.F. Skinner. Um, and he did things like the Skinner box. And um, we'll, talk about, we'll talk about some of his research as well. Um, but with operant conditioning, what we're looking at is that these are voluntary responses. So in classical conditioning, we were talking about involuntary responses. Um, in operant conditioning, one way to tell the difference is that we're talking about things that you're in charge of, things that the animal can actually has voluntary control over. Um, and then we watch these observable behavior responses to this. Now this is still a kind of an associative learning. This is still an association being made um, between two things. Um, but this is one that, um, that we, it's about voluntary responses. Um, and we'll also see that the, um, this, the kind of um, stimulus is coming after the behavior um, instead of before. Um, so we'll see that as a difference too between classical conditioning and operant conditioning. So um, again, in operant conditioning, organisms are making associations between their own behavior and the consequences of that behavior. Now those consequences aren't necessarily negative. They can be positive things as well. They can be reinforcing behavior, um, something that's going to reinforce the behavior. They can be something that's going to punish behavior, behavior and keep it from happening. But the, the association is between their behavior and these consequences. Again, the stimulus is following the response and that's strengthening it. So again, this consequence becomes the stimulus, whether that's a reinforcement, a reward, whether that's a punishment. Um, it's the stimulus is happening after the response, after that behavior, and then again can either strengthen it or diminish it depending on um, what what kind of consequence it is. And actions are followed by, the actions that are followed by reinforcers are more likely to happen again. So if you're given a reinforcer that's like a reward, you're more likely to do that thing again. Um, so if you do something and you get a piece of candy, you're more likely to do that something again to get more candy. Um, if candy's something that you like, if candy's a reward to you. And actions that are followed by punishers are less likely to happen. They decrease. There are some caveats to that. We'll talk about how reinforcement works a ton better than punishment does. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk about those pieces as we move on. So again, operant conditioning is really useful for these voluntary behaviors. Um, where classical conditioning, a lot of it is kind of behaviors that we don't necessarily have control over and that we're not really aware of. Um, operant conditioning is stuff that we really have control over, those voluntary behaviors. Um, and again, it's that consequences that are happening after that behavior change the probability of that behavior happening again. So before Skinner and before it was called operant conditioning, um, this all started with a man named Thorndike. So Thorndike's law of effect, he had these puzzle boxes that he put cats in. Um, and there's a video that you can watch that shows this. Um, and he charted how long it took them to get out of the box. And they had to do a series of little things to get out. There was a latch and there was a string and all these different things to get out of the box. And when they got out of the box, there'd be a treat there for them to eat. Um, and so he measured how long it took them to get out. Um, and what he found was when that behavior was rewarded, they were getting out um, and they were getting a treat, that behavior was more likely to happen again. So at first they got out kind of by chance. Um, and when those chance behaviors were rewarded, they were more likely to happen again. So this is really the starting off point for B.F. Skinner and operant conditioning. So in Thorndike's Law, again, what he says is that the consequence strengthens 
or weakens this connection. Um, so this stimulus response, S is stimulus, R is response. Um, that rewarded behaviors are more likely to reoccur and punished behaviors are less likely to reoccur. Now, if they were coming out of the box um, and they were getting a shock, they wouldn't want to come out of the box. And so they'd be less likely to do that. Again, this is that really that starting off point for B.F. Skinner. Um, it really, he expanded upon Thorndike's work um, and um, it and he took it further and, and, and added shaping onto it. So there was the puzzle boxes for Thorndike. Um, Skinner had his Skinner box or his operant chamber. Skinner did a lot of his research with rats. Um, and so this is a, a, a typical kind of setup he had for rats that to, to study them. So there was a bar or a lever that the animal could press um, or peck at because he did work with pigeons as well. And so that was behavior. A lot of times this would be found by chance. Um, and so again, they would accidentally press the bar, they would accidentally peck at the disc. Um, and then there would be some sort of reward, um, whether it be water or food, um, and then they were more likely to have those things happen again. There was also a recording device that recorded what was going on um, so that they could um, measure these behaviors. So again, remember Skinner was like crazy and behaviorism is crazy about measuring observable behaviors. And so they had lots of methods that allowed them to do this. So in operant conditioning, what Skinner came up with is operant conditioning. Um, and again, one of the big pieces of it is reinforcement. Um, that consequences that, inc that increase the likelihood of behavior. So you do something, that behavior is reinforced, and that behavior is going to be more likely to happen again. Now Skinner says there's two kinds of reinforcement that you can have. You can have positive reinforcement, where you add something desirable. So if you like candy and you do a behavior that I want you to do and I give you a piece of candy, Andy, that's a positive reinforcement. I've given you something. Whereas negative reinforcement subtracts something adverse, okay? So there's a really, really an annoying noise playing and um, you do the behavior I want you to do and I make the noise stop. A perfect example is seatbelts. Um, the uh, the seatbelt beeps, light sound beeps at you until you plug in your seatbelt and you do it to make the sound stop. Um, it makes you more likely to put your seatbelt on next time because you don't want to hear the annoying noise. So it's again a reinforcement. So it's anything that's increasing the likelihood of that behavior. And, and in a positive reinforcement, we're adding something desirable. And in a negative reinforcement, we're subtracting something adverse. Again, nobody's trying to confuse anybody here. So just think of positive and negative reinforcement as whether something's being added or something's being removed. Uh, and a reinforcement is anything that's going to increase the likelihood of that behavior. And also remember that that could be different for different people. Um, and so something that might be reinforcing to one person may not be reinforcing to someone else. If you really like candy, candy can be reinforcing to you. If you don't like candy, candy is not going to be an effective reinforcement. Um, and so... There's that difference as well. Within reinforcement, we have two different kinds of reinforcement. We can have primary reinforcers. This is something that's going to satisfy a biological need. Um, so in the case of the Skinner box, that would have been the food, that would have been the water. Um, these are primary reinforcers. Secondary reinforcers, something they get their relationship through a primary reinforcer. So money is the perfect example of a secondary reinforcer. Money by itself is pretty useless, right? You can't, you can't do anything successful with it. The, the value of money is that you can trade it in for something that you do really need, right? You can trade it in for something that you do really want. Um, but the paper itself is kind of useless. Um, it's the it's it's relationship through that primary reinforcer that's beneficial. Um, so secondary reinforcers, so like tickets, um, you know, sticker charts, things like that. Those can be secondary reinforcers when they count. They add up to something else. So again, a positive reinforcement is anything that we're adding a desirable stimulus. Um, so when you call your dog and you pet the dog, that's a positive reinforcement for the dog. You call the dog, the dog performs that behavior, and you reinforce that behavior positively by adding something desirable to that dog. 
uh, negative reinforcement. Um, things like taking a painkiller is a negative reinforcer. Um, things like, again, fastening your seatbelt. You're removing that adverse effect. Um, you're taking away that thing that you don't enjoy, that adversive thing, and it's being removed, and so you feel better afterwards, and so you're more likely um, for that behavior to happen again. So here's some more examples. Um, if you turn in your homework on time, positive reinforcement would be me saying, great job, thanks for turning in your work on time. Um, negative reinforcement would be if I've been hounding you to turn in your homework and I stop when you turn it in. That's negative reinforcement. In both situations, you feel better afterwards. Um, in one of the situations, I've added something to make that better um, by adding praise. In one of the situations, I've removed something annoying or adverse, um, and, and that's where that positive um, relationship is. So again, a re reinforcement increases behavior. Um, sometimes we can do this by avoiding um, a negative stimulus. Um, so sometimes we can do things where it's not even a removal, this avoidance reinforcement is just to kind of avoid that negative stimulus in the first place. So in the case of the seatbelt, if the next time you don't even forget to plug in your seatbelt, you put it on right away, um, that can be avoidance reinforcement because you already, you didn't want to hear that loud, annoying, beeping noise. And so you plugged in your seatbelt. This can also go kind of further. Um, it can go into a, if an organism has learned it has no control over negative outcomes, um, that in all of their different attempts it doesn't work, um, then they'll kind of give up. And that's what's called learned helplessness. So if they had put these cats in these boxes, um, and no matter what they did, the cats couldn't get out of the box, um, the cat would give up, and the cat would just sit in the corner of the box and give up. Um, the same thing with the rats. If the rats could do all the, press all the different things, they never got fed, it didn't matter what they did, the rats would just give up. Um, and we, this is really negative, right? So this is not good for that organism. It's We see learned helplessness in educational settings as two, and that can be a problem. Um, so again, um, Learn, it can, operant conditioning can have these, um, these real world negative consequences as well. Um, so we really have to be able to, that those attempts have to be something that, that can be successful um, for there to be um, um, this reinforcement. So it can't, the bar can't be too high. So if you're trying to get um, some sort of crazy behavior um, to reinforce, if, if that behavior is too far away from the capabilities of that organism, you're not going to be able to get it and that organism is going to give up. Um, and so that's where, where learned helplessness comes in. So if a behavior is less likely to occur, that's a punishment, right? We're all unfortunately familiar with that. We grew up, we got punished for uh, bad behaviors. Um, and so this is any consequence that decreases the likelihood of behavior happening again. Um, a positive punishment, I know that sounds kind of like an oxymoron, um, but a positive punishment is something that we're adding something undesirable. Um, so it's again a negative st stimulus that's been added. So a spanking would be a perfect example of a positive punishment. Something adverse, the hitting, has been added. So we're adding something that behavior is less likely to happen again because of um, this spanking. Negative punishment would be like grounding, something we're subtracting something desirable. So just like in, in reinforcement, when something was added, it was positive. When something was subtracted, it was negative. That's the same thing we'll see here in punishment. Punishment is just something where we're less likely to see that behavior happen again. It decreases the likelihood of that. So in negative punishment, the perfect example is grounding. Um, you're grounded from seeing your friends. Your friends have been removed, um, and so um, you're less likely to engage in that behavior. Um, you're grounded from technology that's been removed and you're less likely to um, behave that way again. So again, removing some sort of positive stimulus. Um, again, the dog is barking, you spray water on him, that's adding something negative to the dog, um, less likely to happen again. Um, a traffic ticket's the same way. Um, negative punishment, <clears throat> we'll be taking away, again, the driving privileges, revoking a library card for not payment of fees, these sorts of things. So again, a punishment decreases behavior. And if it's positive, we're just adding something undesirable. And if it's negative, we're taking away something desirable. So here's another example. Um, you're showing off by speeding in your car. Um, a positive punishment would be getting pulled over and getting a ticket. Um, a negative punishment would be you lose $250 to pay the ticket. 
Um, and so both of those are punishments. So the actual being pulled over and ticketed feels pretty bad. You're adding in that police slights. You're adding in that waiting for the police officer to come. All of that feels uncomfortable and bad. So that's that positive something's been added. Um, that ticket that you got that has a $250 fine is also a punishment. It's a negative punishment. It took away something desirable, $250. But in this situation, um, you might also have a negative reinforcement um, where you, the person who is tailgating, you get away from them. Um, and so you're being reinforced because you lost that adverse, um, that adverse situation, somebody tailgating you. Now, obviously, I gave several examples about punishment and caregiving. Um, so what's important to remember is that punished behavior is actually just suppressed. It's not forgotten. Um, so it doesn't mean that they won't behave that way again. Um, it just is kind of suppressing that behavior. We actually find that re reinforcement works a lot better because reinforcement tells you how you should behave um, instead of just saying how you shouldn't behave. So punishment really just teaches discrimination amongst situations. Um, so just like we had discrimination in classical conditioning, we have discrimination in operant conditioning. Um, and so what you find is that if your kid says, a kid says a bad word around their parents and they get punished, um, but they say a bad word on the playground or with their friends and they get rewarded, their friends think it's funny, what you find is that they just learn not to say those words in front of their parents um, and not necessarily they learn not to say those words. So they're discriminating between those stimuli between those um, those situations. Punishment can also um, really teach fear. Um, it can associate it with the person administering the punishment um, as well as the punished behavior. Since we are talking about associative learning here, we can make associations with more than just um, the behavior that we engaged in. We can make associations with the person that's administering um, the punishment. Um, so we can, those associations can have kind of overreaching um, consequences that we didn't necessarily in, um, entail. Punishment can also, in terms of physical punishment, can actually increase aggression. Um, when we talk about observational learning, we'll talk about the antisocial effects of anti of observational learning. Um, by seeing these, uh, by seeing this aggression, by having this aggression performed on you, you learn that that aggression is an appropriate response. Um, and so we see that physical punishment can increase aggression. And again, like I said, punishment tells you what not to do, where reinforcement tells you what to do. Um, and so when we get to the end of the chapter and we talk about applied behavior analysis, applied behavior analysis is really focusing more on those reinforcements, those behaviors that we want and reinforcing those positive behaviors. Um, there is some still punishment of negative behaviors because it's still operant conditioning, but we have the kind of an overarching focus on those, re those reinforcements of the positive behaviors because that's actually the behavior you want to see, right? That's the thing that you want to have happen again. Um, so, you know, if you want the child to be respectful to their parents, when they're respectful to their parents, say, oh, yeah, it was so nice that you were so respectful to your parents. That's that positive reinforcement that you're adding praise. Um, and so telling you what to do instead of telling you what not to do. Other things that operant condition um, can be used for, we talked about BF Skinner and shaping. So shaping is, again, when the behavior is something that the person or the organism, it's too big, they can't really do it. They can't do it yet. Um, and so this is something that, um, here's an example, the example that video that you have to watch on this is about teaching a dog to turn on a light switch. Um, that's, that's big, right? That's not something the dog was just gonna accidentally turn on the light switch, right? It's not a behavior that we're gonna accidentally find um, and then can be rewarded for. So you have to get um, kind of closer to it and it's kind of by approximations, by little pieces of it, and then eventually build up to turning on the light switch. Um, this is the same kind of thing that they do with animal training um, in general at like um, water parks where they have marine animals 
doing different behaviors that aren't natural behaviors for them, um, this is where you will be seeing. You'll be seeing that they've gone through operant conditioning and shaping. Um, in zoos and different um, things where they're needing to teach animals how to kind of give out their arm for a blood draw or um, different kinds of health related things that aren't again in the animal's natural behavior, um, shaping and operant conditioning is being used. Um, so you can see that in these situations. We also still have extinction um, in operant conditioning, just like we have discrimination and generalization um, from classical conditioning. We have them in operant conditioning as well. Um, this picture that I have, um, this video that I have for you to watch here, um, again, is um, linked for you. Um, but it's this gradual weakening or disappearance of a response. So what you have is a kid that keeps throwing themselves down um, and crying every time they see the parent. Um, at some point, the kid threw themselves down and got a attention. Um, and they liked that attention. And so they were more likely to do that behavior again. Um, the parent has since figured that out um, and has stopped giving them that attention. And so the kid, you know, comes and tries to do this behavior to try and get that attention that they want. Um, and the parent's not having it. And so you start to see this gradual weakening um, and hopefully for the parent's sake, disappearance of this response of this behavior. Again, that video is linked on iCollege for you. Um, so this is, um, this cartoon here is, is saying the same thing, that you can, you know, play dumb as long as you can so you can keep getting these rewards. And this leads us nicely into schedules of reinforcement. Um, so if you get rewarded every time you do a behavior, um, what we call is that's called continuous reinforcement. Um, you are being continually reinforced for that behavior. So if every single time um, you came to class, I gave you a piece of candy, um, that would be continuous reinforcement. Um, I would be, you would rapidly learn that if you come to class, you'll get a piece of candy. Um, but by the same token, if I stop giving you candy, you might be less likely to come to class. Um, and so what we see in continuous reinforcement is that we have really, really rapid learning. Um, animals and organisms and humans make these associations very, very quickly. Um, but the problem is, is once that reinforcement goes away, um, that association is broken. So what we see is sometimes more beneficial is what we call partial reinforcement. Partial reinforcement has slower learning, um, but it has a greater resistance to extinction. Um, and so it's not going to happen, um, you know, you stop giving the candy once or twice and all of a sudden you're not an extinction. Um, so we have two different kinds that we're going to talk about. Um, we can have ratios, which is every so many. Um, and then we can have intervals, which is about time, so every so often. And then we can have these on a fixed schedule. Um, so, you know, every five times, you know, you get five punches on your punch card, you get a free whatever, coffee, burrito, depending on your punch card, right, haircut. Um, that would be a fixed ratio schedule. Um, a fixed interval schedule would be, you know, every month you get, you know, a $5 gift card for being in this rewards program. That'd be a fixed interval um, um, re reinforcement schedule. Um, whereas variables, it's unpredictable. They don't know exactly how often or when that's going to come. Um, so you could have um, a fixed a, sorry, a variable ratio, um, a random number of behaviors, you get something. So fly fishing and slot machines um, are great examples of that. Um, if you like playing slots, you know, and you get that win, that feels really good. If you like fishing and you get that catch, that feels really good. You don't know when it's going to happen. Um, you don't know how many times you're going to have to cast that line before it happens. But when it does happen, it feels really good. And so you're more likely to keep wanting to try. Um, if you enjoy fishing. <laughs> um, the uh, variable interval um, would be every so often. So it's about an amount of time. So this is after a certain amount of time, um, but we don't know how long. We don't know if it's a day, we don't know if it's a week, we don't know if it's you know a couple hours, um, but it's again after every so often. So let's talk about each of these in a little bit more detail. Um, so what we see is that um, we have for fixed ratio, um, which is this purple line, um, this reinforcement follows a set number of behaviors. So you can see that it kind of looks like a stair step, and that's because it's a fixed number of behaviors, right? Um, it's fixed, and so there's a stair step. 
right? Um, and so what we see really here is that we get a really quick response here with the fixed ratio um, in, in terms of time. But we'll also get a quick response with um, a variable ratio. Um, so this is the number of behaviors. Um, and so it's still about... Um, behaviors, it's still about behaviors, but you can see the little tick marks are further spread apart, right? So we have a red one, and then we have, you know, we have one down at the bottom, and we don't have any more till the top. You can see where it says reinforcement are those little tick marks on the line. Um, so what we'll see is these ratios following number of behaviors um, is a quicker learn because it is an easier association to make. It's between the number of times you do something, um, the number of times you throw a basket, you'll get a, you, you might get one in, right? Right? That would be a variable uh, ratio. It's about behaviors. Um, it's not about the amount of time that's lapsed, which is what intervals are about. Intervals about the amount of time that's lapsed. Um, in a fixed interval, that's going to be the set number of time that's elapsed. Um, so again, you know, if you're in a rewards program, every month you get a reward. Um, that month is that fixed interval. Um, whereas in a variable interval, um, that's going to happen after an unpredictable amount of time has passed. And so you can see that these have a lot lower in fixed interval. You still see those kind of stair step because it's fixed, right? Um, and in variable, you see more of a straight line. Um, but again, what you see is that this is a lot slower um, in terms of the acquisition of this learning. So what we'll see in operant conditioning is that really those timing of those consequences um, can kind of also influence this as well. So we can have delayed reinforcement or delayed punishment um, versus immediate. Um, and we'll see that we'll have different kinds of behaviors based on that as well. And then finally, again, that applied behavior analysis is really using these operant principles to modify behaviors in humans. Um, and so there's your book gives examples of tons of different research studies and tons of different areas that use them. They definitely use them with kids and schools. They definitely use this um, in um, different kinds of settings. Um, and so again, um, we're using those operant principles to really really modify the behaviors in humans. So this is something, the behaviorism is really long lasting and has had a lot of really good benefits because it really does explain a lot of the ways that we learn. Now, just like classical conditioning, it doesn't explain all the ways that we learn. Um, and so see you soon to talk about observational learning, another way that we learn. Thanks so much.